So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do um, under my links on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. I'd like to start with some words from a book called The Active Life, A Spirituality of Work, Creativity, and Caring by Parker J. Palmer. Try as I might, I have found little help in the intentional disciplines of contemplation. So I have no spiritual techniques to, to suggest how to do it. But I have learned that life compensates for my disability by providing moments of unintentional contemplation. And those are the experiences that I want to explore. If we pay attention to them, such experiences can become the disciplines of contemplation for some of us. In the moments I'm thinking of, the foundations of life often seem swept away, so we may find it difficult to experience them as either contemplative or hopeful, especially if we labor under another common illusion, one that pictures contemplation as a direct flight to nirvana. But if we drop this notion of how contemplation is supposed to feel, we begin to see that life makes con contemplatives of all of us whether we want to be contemplatives or not. The only question is whether we can name and claim those moments of opportunity for what, we, for what they are. For example, there is the experience we commonly call disillusionment, when a trusted friend lets us down, an institution we had relied on fails us, a vision we had believed in turns out to be a hoax, or, worst of all, when we discover ourselves to be less than we had thought. Many of us try hard to avoid such experiences, and when we are in the midst of them, we go through a kind of dying. But the very name we give these moments tells us something. It tells us that something positive is happening through our pain. We say we are being disillusioned. That is, we are being stripped of some illusions about life about others, about ourselves. As our illusions are removed, like barriers on a road, we have a chance to take that road further towards truth. Instead of commiserating and offering a shoulder to cry on when a friend says he or she is disillusioned, we ought to congratulate, celebrate, and ask the friend how we can help the process go deeper still. Pain is one of the sure signs that contemplation is happening. Contemplation may lead eventually to bliss, but first it will give us pain of knowing that some of our dearest convictions are shallow, inadequate, and wrong. Contemplation first deprives us of familiar comforts. Then it replaces them with an, inter, an inner emptiness in which new truth, often alien and unsettling truth, can emerge. The contemplative journey from illusion to reality may have peace as its destination, but en route, it usually passes through some fearsome places. Henry Nouwen did a series of lectures on Vincent van Gogh, and Carol Berry captured them in a book called Learning from Henry Nouwen and Vincent Van Gogh, A Portrait of the Compassionate Life. Henry Nouwen disclosed to us that Vincent Van Gogh's initial fervent desire had been to become a pastor, not an artist. 
After failing in the career chosen for him by his family, an art dealer, he decided to follow his father's footsteps. His father was a respectable Calvinist parson of small country churches in the south of Holland. He fulfilled the role of a traditional parish cleric, somewhat segregated and limited by expectations and religious customs of the day. The parsonist physically set the parson's family apart from the common life of the villagers. But Vincent didn't want to be that kind of pastor or do that kind of pastoring from the vantage point of privilege. Vincent rejected being set apart, something that generally comes with ordination to the priesthood or ministry. Instead, he wanted to enter into the experience and the condition of those he served just as Jesus had done. He aimed to authentically embrace those who suffered, to live among them, endure their experiences, and work as hard as they did. He believed in living in an in integrated manner rather than remaining separated by the dictates of social standing. But such intimate involvements with the parishioners he would come to find brought about great suffering and often loneliness and in his case, rejection by the institution he served. In one of his earlier classes, Henry showed us a slide of a drawing by Vincent of a landscape with pollard birch trees that had been stunted in order to produce new straight branches. Such trees grow along many of the alleys throughout Holland. It was a sketch Vincent had made early in his artist voc vocation. The rows of birch trees, their bare new growth branches reaching skyward, stand on ground that is covered with tufts of dry reed-like weeds. The trees form a barrier separating two dark peasant figures, partly silhouetted, against the light background of the sky. They both seem to walk away from the viewer, one herding his sheep before him. It is a bleak image of loneliness. Henry showed this to in illustrate that a compassionate and involved ministry can be a lonely venture. He told us that we would often suffer from isolation in our future ministries despite being surrounded by human beings. Human beings often desperately seeking a comforting relationship. It is often enormously difficult to reach a level of solidarity where trust and intimacy lead to such a relationship. By drawing our attention to this sketch, Henry introduced us to Vincent's ability to do drawings that related feelings and emotions. Through such drawing, Vincent could express a universal kind of loneliness that he experienced. Henry called it cosmic loneliness. To add to our understanding of Vincent's narrative language, Henry used the artist's descriptions of this kind of isolation taken from one of his early letters. At the time when Vincent wrote these thoughts, he was living among the destitute miners in an impoverished mining district in Belgium. After having failed in his attempt to study theology and become a pastor like his father, Vincent had nevertheless found a way to minister and preach the gospel to the poor, namely by becoming an evangelistic minister missionary instead. This is what led him to the miners. Out of his desperate struggle to effect effectively find ways to connect with them, he wrote, someone may have a great fire in his soul, yet no one ever comes to warm himself at it, and the passers-by see but a little smoke coming out of the chimney and continue on their way. Look here now, what must be done, tend that inner fire have salt in oneself, wait patiently, yet how, with so much impatience, wait for the hour, I say, until someone will come and sit down to stay. Henry Nowen had experienced this sense of difficulty in achieving intimacy and solidarity many times throughout his, the course of his life. It was a quote that meant a lot to him since he could identify with the desire to embrace the world and yet passers-by see only smoke coming out of the chimney. In time, 
Henry learned that the effort to reach out in a compassionate way would first require a level of oneness with the passers-by where the barriers of defensiveness and mistrust had to be dissolved. The solidarity Henry was talking about had to grow mature by waiting patiently and by faithful adherence to the great call to be the same. Yes, more of the same. And that's the first step of compassion. Vincent's time in Belgium could teach us about responding to the call of solidarity needed in order to connect with the passers-by. Kelly Roberts writes in Taking Flight, Taking action against fear also means embracing the notion of unlearning ourselves, breaking down the walls we built to keep us safe until we see ourselves as we did when we were eight years old, brave, creative, curious, alive. So often we think the older we get, the more answers we'll have. We associate wisdom with age. While there's some truth to this, perhaps we can, in reality, best associate our true, uninhibited selves with who we were when we were younger. I think we knew who we were, in essence, and in pure creative spirit, when we were eight, nine, ten years old, before we let fear enter our world and spoil our vision. Who were you in those years? What did you love to do? What made you happy? What would your life be like if you reclaimed that spirit, that childlike wonder, and made it part of who you are today? For me, remembering my younger self was a lot like becoming a runner. When my thinking began to shift from a place of fear into a place of limitlessness. I believe this is possible for all of us. We begin to see and remember the best parts of ourselves and in turn begin to surrender ourselves to our own very own possibility. We can remember our fearless selves, our inspired selves, our joyful selves. It's all possible, one step at a time. We were born for this journey, fears, struggles, love, inspiration, all of it. And we were born with a set of our very own wings. Sometimes we just have to rediscover them. Of course, we can't expect our fears to disappear overnight. Often, just when we think we, they've left us, we find they've cleverly transformed themselves instead. In my journey, this is evident in a journal entry I wrote as things were starting to unfold in my creative life and I was beginning to enjoy some success. In my moodiness and quietness the last few days, I've had some weird feelings of fear, fear of being found out. It's a strange and vague sense that I've fooled everyone into thinking I'm thoughtful, talented, and worthy of success, when on the inside it feels more like inadequacy. My filmmaker friend calls it the imposter syndrome, when you're worried that others are realizing you're not so talented or smart after all, and that you just fooled them all into thinking so. In hindsight, I was fearing my own potential, my own light, my own talents. What a change. I had journeyed through the whispers, through the fears of beginning, through the tangled web of finally settling into a creative life. And now I was fearing my own success and joy. I was right back where I started. Who did I think I was? Only this time it was, who did I think I was to be having so much fun and enjoying life so much? Has this happened to you? Do you think you're having too much fun sewing those adorable sock monsters or scrapbooking your memories or painting your hearts to your heart's content? Try not to doubt this blissful feeling. It's your creative spirit soaring. This is what it's supposed to feel like. We must above all else own our, our joy and our journey into our creativity. 
we've earned this feeling of soaring. After all, we face the very direction of our fears, identified them, and made a choice to take small steps in spite of them. And now, here we are taking flight into our creative dreams. This is what we were meant to do. Don't forget to celebrate. Thank you.